Avant Helga nous apporte so before Helga concludes uh, the conference, I would like to say something which is sort of, uh, of a reflection over this last uh, panel. Uh, First of all, the oligarchy, pour in order to paralyze and control human beings, promotes the idea according to which man is by nature predator, bad, and that it is opposed by its very existence to nature. That's the first thing. The second one is the idea that time is a reality that perceived by our senses and that eventually we can stop time at a certain moment. And that biodiversity uh, is that way and uh, it's that way forever. If any new species comes, uh, we ask her her passport and uh, or kick it out and all the ancient species must be maintained. And then the last thing is that all resources are limited. I want to say vis-à-vis uh, -vis all these those things, uh, rethink of the cycle of precession of the axis of the Earth uh, towards uh, its galaxies. That's uh, the 100,000 years cycles. If you go to uh, the Museum of uh, Si vous allez measurements. If you go to the Museum of Totabel, uh, I advise you to go to see it. There are on the walls uh, and in the rooms of the other an idea of what happened in the last 500,000 years. In those regions of Europe, there was been rhinoceros uh, with uh, and, and, and with, 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 with uh, wool over them and uh, glass and snow all over the place. And other times, uh, tigers and uh, crocodiles, giant uh, versions of those animals. So there's something uh, which happens in the nat in nature. Uh, things change, and those cycles of hundred thousand years of change are very important. So you cannot stop time as a, uh, and preserve things uh, at the moment. Uh, is uh, a totally infantile idea, and if you have an, an infantile idea, then the, you are you are manipulable, and uh, oligarchies can control you. So uh, think about what uh, Odile Mojon told us: uh, to think uh, is essential, and to think about what uh, the human beings can contribute say, towards their species and towards the environment in which they are living, not only the Earth, uh, but the solar system and the galaxy. Alors, so, obviously, if you examine, mais pas seulement, in particular, but not only, Judaism and Christianism, to pretend to stop time at one point is conceived like uh, uh, a sin, uh, an act against mind. If you look at modern science, Einstein in particular, space and time are not absolute uh, uh, given questions. They are relative. The time-space is relative. So in relation to those things, you must think of uh, the idea of Heraclitus, which uh, is probably the, the first one, uh, well, after the Vedas in India. Uh, they say that the only thing permanent is change. And indeed, uh, it's this uh, agreement between human beings able to transform, to think, to improve their universe, uh, which makes them totally different from, from uh, animals. And it's a very positive uh, task, uh, not uh, negative. And this possibility of uh, change and transforming the universe is what gives us a future. And uh, the oligarchy promotes the idea of cultural pessimism, of a man who necessarily has negative effects on nature, we separate man from nature, one underestimates completely the power of nature. Uh, the Greenies do that, and uh, this separation leads to a justification for uh, depopulation, since there are limited resources, since uh, we can stop the clock of time at one point, uh, since we have to admit that uh, those who are above uh, have the means to control and they have the right to do that. Therefore, one has to submit, uh, one has to admit uh, that we want to stay all the time the way we are. And if we look at our European societies, one thing is very characteristic is the reflection of all this 
uh, beyond the collapse of uh, culture, is uh, something of which Helga will speak. The other thing is uh, abstentionism during elections. Human beings are no longer uh, intervening like citizens uh, in politics, and the oligarchy uh, is very happy about that. And uh, they hope that in France in 2017, there, there be a race between Sarkozy, Le Pen, and François Hollande. So a sort of freezing of time, which is against that which we want to mobilize, those three people that I, it's just a small reflection on the cavern wall. But the real uh, challenge is to find within ourselves uh, the, the, the strength so to be creative, so to march uh, in the unknown, so, uh, to have those qualities of the astronauts, astronauts who, who find necessarily new things, and to live, they have to be able to invent new things. And one of the importances of the uh, space, uh, this uh, imperative, extraterrestrial imperative, is that uh, it forces everybody to know, so to, uh, to discover, and those who will have uh, the highest competence uh, in terms of physics uh, and culture, and the highest competence in the manual fields. And we find there the uh, future of humanity, which is uh, to go discover elsewhere uh, for the interests of all and for mutual development. So I find that it's in this way uh, that we must look at this last panel. Our future in this context is in the domination of processes that occur in the galaxy and in the solar system from the Earth without necessarily uh, having uh, 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 to go uh, in a kind of Hollywood uh, epopee uh, uh, to go to these places uh, because uh, the, the galactic radiation and uh, solar radiation is uh, very difficult to deal with. So what I think, uh, if Einstein had not played the violin some uh, a few hours uh, or at least one and a half hours a day, he would not have been the best scientist and the most important in the 20th century in the US. So from that standpoint, I want to ask Helga to conclude for us and to go into that domain of culture, which is uh, the fundamental uh, thing uh, with which we want to, we, we have to deal with in the morning when we uh, awake and in the evening when we go to bed. Well, I would like to go into the matter of, of culture, but for, unfortunately I have to go first in the area of counterculture. Um, and that is uh, in commenting on you know, the, this last panel, <clears throat> um, I was very, very uh, shocked and, and, you know, as a matter of fact, <laughs> it really shows we are in a war, in a war for, for civilization, because it was just revealed um, that the new papal encyclica, which is supposed to come out on the 18th of June, in a couple of days, uh, will be on climate change, and if you look at who will be the presenters, the official presenters of that encyclica, it will be Cardinal Turkson, who is the head of Justitia at Pax. Uh, it will be the Metropolitan John of Pergamon, a leading uh, representative of the Orthodox Church of Greece, and it will be our old acquaintance who I just accidentally mentioned yesterday in my speech, it will be Schellenhuber. Now, <laughs> this is really incredible because Ben Dennison mentioned in his uh, remarks earlier, you know, that the evil is really situated in this ideology. Now, that means the devil is about to take over the Catholic Church. Uh, or has already taken, or they're trying to compete for evil with the Protestant church in this respect. Now that is a declaration of war because they have said that they want to influence two major conferences. One is the uh, <clears throat> International Conference on Financing for Development, which will take place in Addis Abeba, which means they want to completely influence that conference that you know, only sustainable technology, only 
uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, <clears throat> appropriate technology. And, you know, you have to understand that our fight against that goes back 40 years or more. Because, you know, because we had a, con a positive conception, I mean, I, I joined this organization because when I went on this trip in 1971 on a cargo ship which brought me to Africa, uh, in parts of Asia, to Malaysia, Thailand, uh, China, in the middle of the Cultural Revolution, but also I, I could spend a couple of days in some cities in Africa, and I spent some longer time in China. Um, I came back from that trip with a, I mean, I really was absolutely convinced the world could not be like that. It could not remain like that, because if you travel with a cargo ship, you, you get a completely different picture than if you go with a cruise liner, a luxury ship, or you know, if you have your well-to-do life and you jet set around the globe and you go from four-star, five-star hotel to five-star hotel, you don't see this. And if you belong to a certain uh, layer in society, they blind themselves to the real condition of, of where mankind is. But when you go with a cargo ship, you see the world as it is. Like, you know, I mean, in Dakar, uh, Senegal, I went from the ship in the morning at six o'clock, and there were 20 people, beautiful, long, great Senegalese women and men who are taller than even me uh, were, and they tried to sell me some handicraft. And I told them, look, I don't have money, I'm a student, I, I cannot buy this. And they, I could not convince them that it was futile. And I thought, what does this do to the dignity of men if adult people feel that they have to run after me, a poor student, you know, and I knew it, I couldn't get it across to them. Then I went, we went to Thailand and at the port, parents brought their 10, 11, 12 year children as prostitutes for the sailors. The parents brought them, you know, and I, mean, I could go on and on, but when you see how, what poverty does to people in their desperation, you understand that poverty is the biggest human rights violation there is. And therefore, you know, you know I joined this organization because when I met uh, Mr. LaRouche, he had these ideas that you have to develop the developing countries. And we started to have, you know, plans for Africa, the first book on the development of Africa we published in 1976. And actually we had here in Paris a presentation of that plan, <clears throat> uh, you know, which was very clear. It is what still is, is needed. You need ports, you need uh, bridges, you need roads, railway, you need infrastructure because without infrastructure you don't even have agriculture because you can't transport whatever is being produced. You need food processing. And, you know, it would be so easy to do all of this if there would be a political will. So anyway, now we are here uh, so much later, but, you know, I mean, this has been a war between our organization and like-minded people, like Indira Gandhi, with whom we worked on a 40-year development plan for India. We worked with Lopez Portillo on a development plan for Latin America, which he started to implement. Uh, and you know, would have it would have succeeded if at that time Argentina and Brazil would have cooperated. Then in 1974, I went to the UN uh, Population Conference in Bucharest, and I went there with a development plan, which was essentially the idea that you need a large-scale technology transfer from the industrialized countries to the developing sector. And it would have been very easy to overcome the underdevelopment. But what happened, you had John D. Rockefeller III, who presented his plan, um, which essentially was the first time they used this technology, this terminology, sustainable development, appropriate technology. And pro appropriate technology is the Africans should never get railways. They should have little shovels and little fountains in their village and you know, do things which is appropriate to them. So at that point, you know, these ideas were new. Environmentalism was, was really not yet existent. 
And all the left groups who were at this Bucharest population conference, they said, oh, population uh, explosion, which, you know, Rockefeller said there is an explosion of population, we have to reduce population. And all the left groups said, oh, uh, pop the population bomb is a Rockefeller baby, you know, because people knew that that was an oligarchical interest. And I intervened at that conference. I said, look, in the consequence of what you are proposing is 100 times worse than Adolf Hitler. Now, that was absolutely true, because if you count the number of people who have died as a consequence of the denial of technology, of imposing IMF conditionalities on the third world, I have one time calculated, you come to hundreds of millions of people. And, you know, in a certain sense, We have now a situation where Schellenhuber, who is a CBE, a commander of the British Empire, who is a complete fraudster, he's a psych, psychic, uh, you know, psychologically very difficult person to use diplomatic language, uh, <clears throat> but you know, that he is now influencing the Catholic Church for a decarbonization of the world economy. I mean, we fought this when he presented it to the German government, because it would mean to eliminate every fossil fuel, it would mean to eliminate naturally nuclear energy uh, altogether, and you know, if you only go by renewable energies, wind, solar, and so forth, you end up with a population uh, carrying capacity of the Earth of about one billion people. And you know, we have studied the Uh, zero growth movement <clears throat> way back into the early 70s. And there, there were people who said, well, how do you reduce population? Well, there are the four riders, uh, horse, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, war, death, famine, epidemics, and you just let these things grow and then the population reduces by itself. Now, if they succeed to impose that into the Paris Climate Conference, you know, which I don't think will happen, but you know, there will be a massive attempt to do that, it would be tantamount to you know, really turn these institutions into genocidalist institutions, and we really have to fight against that with all possible means, because this is, this is a form of, of Nazism or fascism, it's eco-fascism or I don't know how you call it, but it's really, it's really that. And <clears throat> so I think that we have to really mobilize in all countries around the world to block that. And I think the panel this afternoon gave us excellent ammunition. These are fraudsters. They are, you know, they are uh, <clears throat> the kinds of scientists, I don't know if you remember this old uh, uh, record, you know, where you had a little dog and an, a, a, a gramophone, and you know, they sing the song of who feeds them. These are not scientists, these are people who, this goes back to you know, how they try to, to, to destroy the influence of Leibniz in the Berlin Academy. You know, they would have contests in which the most corrupt scientists would, would then be promoted, and you know, people like um, Uh, Kestner and, and Lessing and so forth, they fought against these people. This is an old trick by the oligarchy. And right now, you have a situation you know, where many of these scientists are bored. They're not scientists, they're just doing what you get a grant for. And some of the better scientists even use a green terminology in order to get any funding. You know, and then they sneak in their little project you know, so that they can do some research, but they give it a green name to get the funding. I mean, the corruption of the mind is incredible. Why do you think this whole thing functions? Why do you think we are on the verge of war? Because people are too stupid to think things through and they belong to clubs where it is the peer belief to not think that way. If you are part of a club you know, which is pro-British or pro-American, then you don't even think that it could be different. You know, and I can only challenge you, you know, if you have any doubts about what has been said here about that we are on the verge of World War III, if you have any respect for your mind, you do not just reject it, you go home and you do your homework. Because if you have not yet studied it and come to that conclusion yourself, you are just intellectually lazy. 
because I have done the work. I have done, I looked in all the papers of all the military experts in America, in Great Britain, in Germany, in France, in Italy, in Russia, in China, and there is no question that if you look at the evolution of the military doctrine, if you look at the whole forward deployment, if you look at the whole first strike doctrine, if you look at the Russian reactions, at the Chinese reactions, if you don't come to the conclusion that we are on the verge of World War III, I hate to say it, you are an intellectual lazy bum or worse. Uh, because that, if you are serious, you have to come to that conclusion. If you come to that conclusion, you have to get off your behind. You know, because you have to do something to help to save civilization. Uh, and, you know, I think the corruption of the mind comes mainly from the fact, you know, it's not, we are not promoting anybody's cause. You know, I really think we are the only organization which takes the future into account a thousand years from now. I even would say a couple of billions of years from now because I want the humanity to be the immortal species. I have some, uh, you know, good contacts who are geophysicists, and they tell me the human race will disappear one second after 12 or after midnight. You know, and I do not accept that because for me, I don't know if you remember when the Voyager left our solar system uh, <clears throat> a couple of months ago, um, they had records on the uh, spaceship of Fort Wengler's Fort Wengler conducting Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. So the Fort Wengler uh, <clears throat> conducting the Ninth Symphony is now traveling outside of our solar system, which for me is a very intriguing idea that if there are some intelligent people somewhere, we don't know because the universe is really big and you know, we, we only know a very tiny part of it. It could be that somebody gets this record and listens to Fort Wengler's conducting of the Ninth Symphony. But the idea that all of that would have been for nothing, all the great struggles of mankind, the British people, uh, you know, the Indian people, freeing themselves from British imperialism, Mahatma Gandhi, uh, other struggles, the Chinese liberating themselves from the opium war, uh, you know, all the many, many courageous people, the German resistance who tried to fight Hitler who, and who got chopped off, uh, you know, all the beautiful human activities which led to the point where we are here today would have been for nothing I think that that is a completely unacceptable idea. And in the same spirit, like Schiller wrote his universal history, or why we should study universal history, uh, you know, I think that we should have a gratitude to the rich donations from previous generations and organize our life in such a way that we give it more rich to the future generations. And, you know, I think that this is really something I want to put into your heart and into your mind. You know, don't think narrow, because it is the narrowness of the mind which has led to two world wars. And we have set out explicitly with the idea that we must overcome geopolitical thinking, because geopolitics has led two times to a world war in the 20th century, and because of the existence of thermonuclear weapons, if we don't get over, therm over geopolitics right now, the danger is that we will extinct ourselves. And, you know, you know why did I mention yesterday in my uh, remarks the difference between ratio and intellect? Uh, and I really want you to think about it because most people, they think, yeah, it's my... Menschenverstand, my, my common sense, I know everything myself, uh, I'm a learned man, I have studied, I have titles of all kinds, you know. But people don't, are not self-conscious. What happens if they are thinking on the level of ratio, which is, you know, you think in terms of contradictions, you think that my interest is against that interest, that, you know, I have this interest against the other person's, and what's the difference if you think about on the level of reason, or as Cusanus calls it, the level of intellect? Then you think on the level of the coincidencia oppositorum, the coincidence of opposites, 
which is an idea to look through or you look on the level where the contradictions no longer exist. And in the philosophy of the Platonic humanist tradition of Europe, it's the idea that the one has a higher order and a higher power than the many. And you have to think in this way because, you know, when you, as long as you remain on the level of contradictions, you can't solve any problem. I mean, that was the great achievement of the Peace of Westphalia because they recognized that 150 years of religious war in Europe, you know, if they would have continued, nobody would have been left because in some areas of Europe, there were two thirds of humanity already destroyed. So they came to the conclusion that a higher principle had to be found, the idea of <clears throat> uh, you know, the interest of the other, that a permanent peace can only be built on the interest of the other. And that is a, 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 you know, a method of thinking which you can apply to every field. You will not make a new discovery in science if you can't hypothesize what is the necessary step in the unknown. Uh, his uh, scientific discovery is not that somebody has a you know, bright idea and then you discover something. No, it is the accumulation of knowledge of Geistesmassen, more Geistesmassen resonate, and then out of that you know what is the necessary next step of discovery. Like why, for example, thermonuclear fusion is one of the absolute necessary next steps because it leads to a higher energy flux density, which is important for the continued existence of mankind. In the same way, you cannot make a great composition in classical music if you throw out all the laws of the composition. Then you end up with atonal music or <clears throat> with 12-tone music and you end up with ugliness. You have to go through the late uh, string quartets of Beethoven, through the beautiful symphonies, through Brahms, through Schubert, through the beautiful songs of Schubert, and all the high points of classical music, and then define what is the next step of the composition. You have to respect the rules and enlarge the rules in a lawful way. And in that sense, you know, I think that the Mankind has reached a point where I don't think we will get out of this mess, and we have a mess. Uh, you know, if you, if you don't think that we are at a civilizational breakdown crisis, wake up. I mean, if, look, for example, you know, some countries have young people, like Modi. You know, Modi said the reason why India has such a beautiful future is because they have so many young people. And if these young people get educated, they will be the biggest export uh, possibility because there are countries which have demo demographical crises like Germany, Italy. You know, these countries will vanish without the Indians in the future because people don't procreate anymore. I don't know, they, you have too many marriages of all kinds of forms which don't procreate. So sooner or later, they will stop to exist. So fortunately, we have the Indians to help the Germans to survive. Uh, but <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, but Modi said, you know, if we educate these young people, then they are the potential of the future. And that is really, that is really how we have to think. Because, you know, in a certain sense, you know, the civilizational crisis is not just that we are on the verge of World War III, that, you know, we have a refugee crisis which is heartbreaking. You know, if you look at these pictures in the Mediterranean, I mean, I think this is the bankruptcy declaration of the EU. Because this is, you know, this is just the worst of the worst behavior. Uh, instead of developing Africa, they shoot on the boats. You know, what, what, what is that? What, what is the self-image of the EU? But, you know, it's not just that. It's not just that two billion people every day go hungry. Two billion people. One billion is really starving and one billion is, you know, at the edge of, of having not enough to eat. You know, and it is not necessary. Uh, it's not only that. Uh, the drugs. Look at the drugs. How many people are taking drugs? In Russia alone, Every year, 40,000 people are dying of drugs. 
And Russia has said that this is the biggest security, national security crisis they have. Look at the young people who go to discos. 85% of all young people going to discos take drugs. Look at the pornography. I mean, you know, there is no more limit. There is nothing anymore which you cannot see in the public TV. You know, every time I turn on the TV, which happens once in a while, I'm, I'm absolutely shocked. You know, I mean, I don't want to go through the gory details, but I said, this cannot be, it, you know. It, it is, it, if, every time, I think it has reached the absolute bottom of perversity, of pornography, of violence, they come up with something new. And, you know, if you look at the youth culture, the youth culture where eight-year, nine-year, ten-year-old girls and boys, they know everything about sex, about homosexuality, about sexual practices, about, you know, violence, about snuff mo movies. Look at the British crown. Uh, look at what happens now with the pedophilia uh, scandal in Great Britain. This involves the top elite in Great Britain. Sir Leon Britton, whom I have to have had the misfortune to meet in this 96 conference in Beijing, because he was one of the speakers, and he said, oh, the Silk Road will never function, uh, terrorism, uh, destabilizations in all of Central Asia, uh, and it was very clear the British great game does not want this development. Now, this guy is now one, he's dead, he will not be, um, I cannot see God, uh, God Seelish or, you know, uh, he will, he's probably roasting in hell already, um, <coughs> but, you know, he, uh, he was involved in the top pedophilia running, you know, boys' uh, houses, you know, which is huge. It involves thousands and thousands of members of the British elite. You know, they're degenerates. Uh, you know, if you look at the total picture of the youth culture in Europe and in the United States, in the United States, you better don't go shopping because if you go in a mall, you have a good chance that you'll be shot by somebody just driving by. You know, if you look at the death rate in major cities in the United States, if you look at the police violence, you know, why do you think um, in all of these cities, Ferguson, uh, Baltimore, why do you have these riots? You know, because the police in the United States has been militarized. They get the um, heavy weapons from the army to use against their own population. And, you know, if there is a collapse of the financial system, I think that the United States will explode in a civil war because you have these weapons everywhere. You have a violence in the culture, which is really big, and you have now a counter movement where the reverends, you know, unite in all of the United States, and they say we have to get in the act to prevent that this is not happening again. So I, you know, I could go on for a long time, but if you if you are not blind to what is around you, you see that we are not just in a in a war danger, in a breakdown crisis, but we have a civilizational crisis where, you know, like the caste system in India, uh, you know, there are people who think that the lower castes are lower people. And I have met many good friends in India, and I have seen how they behave. You know, I have a good acquaintance, you know, and I saw him behaving towards uh, <clears throat> somebody who brought in the luggage in the hotel. So, you know, this is oligarchical thinking. You know, this person in India is not one iota better then, you know, the queen running trucks and the queen does run trucks. I mean, we have been accused of having said that, but we have proven the case. You know, if you look at the British-Saudi running of terrorism, which is what the issue of the 28 pages uh, is all about, and you heard Walter Jones, there is a growing movement in the United States, and the truth will come out of about all of this. Anyway, I want to make the point, we have a civilizational crisis. Uh, which is really all encompassing. And we have reached in the history of mankind a point where either we make a qualitative jump into a completely new paradigm. You know, and a new paradigm, you know, there are examples in history where you can study it, where you had a breakdown crisis, like in the 14th century in Italy, 
um, or in most of Europe actually, you had the Black Death, you had the Flagellants, you had witch burning, you had a complete, a complete collapse of society and, and a collapse of the financial system. If you look at the pictures of Bosch and Bruegel, you know, where people, uh, they, one eye is going up, the other one is going down, and Bruegel and Bush, uh, Bosch uh, captured, <laughs> well, here you have another one of these <laughs> strange-looking people, but what these painters captured was the mental breakdown of society in a dark age. You know, and then you have to look of how did we manage to get into the golden age of the Italian Renaissance. You know, it happened through many steps. It happened through uh, <clears throat> Dante, Dante Alighieri. It happened through Petrarca and the whole movement of humanists who started to collect handwritings of great thinkers of the past. And then you had the courageous fight of Jeanne d'Arc, uh, which, you know, together with Louis Ons, transformed France uh, the living standard of the French population doubled in 20 years during the reign of Louis XI. And then you had especially Nicolas of Cusa and you know, the people he influenced. And he was consciously saying, we need a completely new thinking. And he attacked the scholastics, he attacked the peripatetics, the Aristotelians, who had dominated all the universities of Europe at that time, and he developed a new method of thinking. What was the basis of the modern nation state, what was the basis of modern science? Uh, Kepler could not have done what he did without Cusa, and he always talked about the divine Cusanus. Uh, Vernadsky talked about the great stepping stone of Kusansky. Unfortunately, Vernadsky is much more known in Russia than uh, in, in, in Europe because it, this is a you know, very good capital which Russia can, is, is using or has used. So we need a break like that. We need to have a completely new thinking, not defined from the present conflicts among nations, among you know, ethnic conflicts, geographical conflicts, all of that, but we have to define mankind as one and think how do we survive as human species in the future. And if you start to define everything from that standpoint, you know, every conflict can be solved. And we have said many times, you know, we do not just need a new world economic order, which you know, we have presented with the idea of a world land bridge as a you know, good approximation of what that could look like. But we need a cultural renaissance because this degenerate culture has to go. You know, and I believe that Confucius and Lessing were completely right when they said, if you decide to become good, you can decide it. If you can decide to be loving, you can start to love. It's a moral question. Can you do it? And you know, in the same way, I think we can break with the general culture. And I think that if each country develops their own high culture, like Germany should obviously revive the German classical period, the music from Bach, Mozart, Haydn, Schubert, Schumann, Beethoven, Brahms, even some songs of Hugo Wolf I want to put into this, <laughs> and I got even my husband to agree with me, uh, and naturally Schiller and <clears throat> you know, other great poets. In France, you have to revive the Ecole Polytechnique. You have to become, again, a, a science driver society in the tradition of the gold thinking of France having a mission. Italy has so many rich scientists and artists, Verdi, Dante, uh, Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, India uh, is a country which has 5,000 years of history. You have to revive the Vedic writings, uh, <clears throat> the Gupta period of, of drama, uh, the <clears throat> Indian Renaissance of the late 19th to mid 20th century, where you had so many beautiful poets and thinkers, Tagore, Sri Aurobindo, and uh, Vivi Kanada, and, and many others. Uh, China is on the best way with Confucius. 
the United States. The United States is struggling right now to revive the better part of its history. Because the United States is not a monolithic monster or a superpower you have to be a slave to or just like because they are the most powerful. No, the United States has two fundamentally tra different traditions. You know, we just had a conference in New York last weekend where uh, the, uh, the thesis was, or the historical research was presented that the real making of America was the overcoming of slavery. You know, it was really the question, you know, which of the founding fathers would be the dominant was it the ones who would fight slavery or was it the you know, compromisers uh, who were really influenced by the, the British Empire? And the British Empire never agreed to have lost the greatest colony or the most important colony for their, uh, for them, for the, from their standpoint. So they tried to subvert it, first through wars, the wars of 1812. The British were allied with the Confederacy uh, you know, the plantation owners, they financed the Confederacy. Then they realized they cannot regain America through military means, and they started then other means, like the Round Table and Lord Milner and, and, and others, the kindergarten. Uh, and the idea was that you have to convince the American uh, establishment to run the world as an empire based on the British Empire. And that's the problem with the Bushes and the Obamas, because that is their philosophy right now. But there is another America, the America of uh, Benjamin Franklin, of uh, <clears throat> uh, Alexander Hamilton, of John Quincy Adams, of Lincoln, of McKinley, of Franklin D. Roosevelt, of John F. Kennedy. And, you know, we are right now very, very far advanced to regain that America. You know, and it's my deepest conviction that without that, there will be no solution to the world's problems. Unfortunately, you, know, you have right now a growing movement of Democrats and even a couple of Republicans, like you saw in the person of Walter Jones. You, know, you have Republicans who are absolutely decent human beings. As a matter of fact, he, I, I wish we had in Germany only one uh, parliamentarian like Walter Jones, you know, because he's an integer man. He's a complete devoted to his constituency, and you know, he, he, there's not one wrong bone in, in in him. You know, and you have others like that. So, you know, America must become a republic again. It must have a foreign policy like John Quincy Adams, who said, you know, we have to have uh, an alliance of perfectly sovereign republics. And that is what has to be, and then there is no problem in the world because with that, everybody will be happy. So, you know, I could probably find in every nation the glorious period, but you, you know it all yourself. And we have to get to the high points of each nation and each culture, and we have to revive that. And then out of that, we will create a new renaissance, you know, and... It will be like other renaissances that you will revive what was beautiful in the past, but then that will be the nourishment to create something even more beautiful for the future. So I think that that is the task we have immediately ahead of us, and I all want you to join in that because this could be the most noble mission for your life, and it is necessary. <laughs>